um, video editing for academics. Thanks everyone for showing up. We're gonna be pretty you know, chill today. Um, if you have questions or um, if you have comments, just feel free to um, ask and you know, it's a, it's a fairly small group. It's only 27 of us. And so uh, the idea, as I just mentioned a, a bit ago is we're going to take turns to kind of show you um, our own interpretations of uh, some video footage that Troy shot and uh, along the way, kind of show you some of the uh, techniques and tools that you'll need to provide your own, to, to produce your own videos, right? So it's a, probably a good idea uh, before you get started, if you have a video that you have in mind that you're thinking of, if you have a, not even a video, um, because it's really about storytelling. So, so what you wanna think about as you're going through this project probably is it would be most helpful to you to think about a story that you wanna tell, a short story that you wanna tell in a few minutes. And as you go through, and as you see how we're putting these stories together, it'll give you an opportunity to think about how you'll put your stories together. Um, Troy, I'm gonna pass it over to you, but before I do, Roy, do you have anything that you'd like to um, enter, add sort of as, a, as an introduction before we get started? I think that part of what we're doing is, is to show you that with any kind of footage, you can make a, an infinite amount of um, adjustments or changes to it. So you, what you'll see tonight is like three different interpretations of the same footage. Um, and just to, just to say that. All right, so Troy, I guess I'm gonna just pass it over to you. Now you probably want to uh, share your own PowerPoint with uh, the folks. Yes, I do. And I'll stop my share and then you can go ahead and, and you can start your share. And unfortunately I have, I have like a lot of things to say. So I'm the blabber at, at, in this session here, but that's okay. All right, so. You know, Troy, he's uh, yeah. the data. <laughs> you know who I am. Yeah. We got Luther in the house here, so. Oh, Luther Luther's in the Elliot. house. All right, yeah. Yeah. Elliot and Luther played, uh, they play tennis and the violin together. <laughs> All right, so here we are, video editing for academics. This is where we're gonna start here. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's dinner time or as we say, supper time in the South. So every, as Mike said, please get a drink on if you have to and here we go. We all have had to complete some kind of project in our lives. Uh, when it comes to making a movie or a video, there are three distinct phases that we can break it down into. There's the pre-production phase of planning, writing, organizing, production, where you actually do it. And then the post-production where you edit and combine and refinish. That's the combin combinatorial aspect of it. And, and that's where a, a lot of stuff happens and it's very fun to do. Another way to look at this, and it's a bit more granular, is to think that you're gonna plan and you're gonna shoot, you're gonna edit, and then you're gonna deliver. These are the four phases that, that work together. And what's great about, about this, this is a continuum. So the more you know about editing, the more that informs how you can shoot something. So if you know, for example, that editing software can show three things at one time, three shots at one time, for example, and that's going to inform the way you plan and then how you shoot. So part of what we're, we, we want to emphasize tonight is that there is a way to practice all of these things. And the more you practice, the more not, you're not perfect, but the more you're prepared. So this pre-production phase, and this is where it gets scary. Like the moment I introduce a storyboard, this, what you see, the, the image on this slide here is a storyboard. And what this is, is a, sh is a shot list of someone who is planning a video. And where I'm, I'm also one of, the, one of the ones who get really frightened when I think that, oh, geez, not only do I have to learn how to make a video, now I had to have to learn how to draw and illustrate things. But that's not, that's not really the point. The when 
when it comes to a video, you kind of have to do it a little bit more because think about, you know, your story is, is something that is audio visual. What are you seeing or what do you want people to see and what do you want them to, to hear? And, you know, this is just one way of organizing that concept. I'm not very good at doing that. I'll, I'm, I'm honest, you know, I'll, I'll show you my storyboard and it's very messy, but it is important to do this because if you don't, then you, when you get to the shooting phase, you, you, you're going to be kind of a bit dis disorganized. Uh, but here's the cool thing. If you've done this, by the time you are ready to shoot your video, you have all the shots mapped out. There's no surprises. Everything is good. So when it comes to the production phase, there's this uh, quote that actually it's from a book. It's called the best camera is the one you have. And I say, or could have with you. Uh, here's the cool thing about when it comes to, to production. The media center has over 60 cameras that you can borrow. So whether it, if you want to go from your iPhone to another camera to a different camera, we have that for you. And there are people in this in this chat who we've helped with that before. So they can also help you out too. If you if you've planned everything out, there's no surprises, and and it is just following through with your plan, right? Uh, you've mapped it all out. It's planned out and there you go and tools 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 you know and and you might like this i asked elliot a while back is a violin a tool and he said of course it is you know of course a violin is a tool for me to make music we shouldn't uh, have any disdain for tools or equipment or things like that uh, if you're going to shoot something and make a video you have to know how to use the tools. And that's where the media center can certainly help you out. We have, we, I mean, we have competent people who can do that and help you with that. And then I put this uh, snarky comment from Haskell Wexler, who's in the cinematographer. History is after all, a recreation of the past by those who have recording tools. And he was privileging tools and making a joke, I think. So one way to look at the story that Mike was talking about is it, it's composed of some parts, right? Like a sentence or a paragraph. So we have a frame, you know, that's one image. We have a shot, that's a continuous series of, of images that creates a sequence and that creates a scene and that creates a story. This is a classical like breakdown of, of the film grammar. What I wanna focus on is the shot. And this is where the production challenges come into play. And this is where we can talk about resources, how we can help you solve those challenges. So, so here in this slide here, there's the typical shot we've all seen, someone opening a fridge, you know, the, of course that doesn't, that, that's impossible. Nobody lives in a fridge. So, but that's one, you know, kind of shot. And of course, Tarantino who's perfected the opening the trunk shot, right? Nobody is in the trunk. It's just a shot of people looking in the trunk. So how do you practice doing these kinds of things? Classic exercise, and it's called the five shot exercise. And by doing this, practice will make you not perfect, but prepared. Okay, apparently last night we had some technical difficulties. So part of my presentation was cut off, so I'm redoing it, which is really apt actually, because filmmaking and movie making is very fake. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing the exact same shirt that I had on last night. So I look like I'm doing it in real per person time, but I'm not. I am doing it after the fact. Movie making is fake but it's not inauthentic. So I was starting to talk about the five shot exercise where you take five shots and try to explain the process or something like that. And practice doesn't make perfect. It makes you prepare. So let me start this presentation.
So here's the breakdown of a five shot exercise. Think of a process you want to re record or tell a story about. It could be doing an experiment, it could be making scallops, baking bread. What I decided is to tell a story about a person who I work with. Her name is Drea. She's an artist, an animator. So I broke it down into five shots. The first shot is a close-up of some action. You know, what is happening? She's she's a she illustrates, so let's talk about her hands. A close up of her face. That humanizes everything. You do a wide shot, where is this happening? You do an over the shoulder shot, something that's totally fake but just shows another perspective and then the fifth shot is where you get creative it could be you could do a Dutch angle you could lay on the floor you could do some camera movement doesn't matter like the fifth shot is where you get to be creative and then try to record an interview these are all little pieces that come together in a video that you'll see here so as I mentioned earlier making a shot list or a storyboard is very important and to prove that you do not need to be talented to do this on the left you'll see my, the image of my storyboard this is the this is my notes for the shots that I made for this video you're about to see very messy but kind of organized right I knew that I was going to do some things and that's important on the right, you'll see an expert storyboard. I, I, I can never do that. That's too creative, too awesome. But that person was also organized. So when you start to shoot by planning, you have minimized all the production gotchas. There's no reason that you're, you're going to be like, oh, wait a minute. How, how is this happening? And also, like, this is not prescriptive. And it doesn't mean that you can't be creative. You may find when you're shooting, you want to see something else or do something else. And that's totally cool. Like th This is just a way to organize stuff. As an example, John Coltrane, uh, his notes for A Love Supreme. S sounds super innovative. Awesome song. Everybody loves it, or I do. But he made notes for it. Everybody makes notes. Creativity is the result of limits, not effacing limits. So, in this five-shot exercise, here's what I did. I took 850 seconds of shots, equals 14 minutes, I think, if I do the math, math right, and turned that into a 30-second video that took two hours to actually shoot. So, those 14 minutes it took two hours to actually get that. And then it took me two and a half hours to edit this. So here we go. Anybody can learn how to draw. I've always said that. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are. It's never too late to start. Um, it, all it takes is just consistency and uh, learning how to see. Um, using reference material, finding things online. There's tons of resources online. There's lots of tutorials out there now. Um, yeah, anybody can start anytime. And yeah, it's just a matter of practice. So there we go. Anybody can learn how to draw. So let's look at the shots. Here's the close up shot. So we have five five shots and I and I have multiple five shots or multiple shots on the five shot. But here's the number one shot, close up of the hands. close-up of the face, a wide shot, where is this happening? This is the over-the-shoulder shot, just a different perspective. And this is over like a bird's eye view kind of shot. And then I did, you know, two other shots on the five shot part of the creative part. One was camera movement, and we'll look at that. And then one was just uh, putting a camera on the table, looking up at the subject. So, here is, on the left, you see this is how, that, how the shot 
on the right was created. A, a suction cup mount that I used on my iPhone to point up to the subject. This is the over the shoulder shot and what's important to note is that a tripod cannot get a shot like this. So what I did is I used an adapter on my phone to another adapter to a mic microphone stand and that's how I got the shot. And it's not because I'm smart that I did that, it's because I'm, I'm just informed that that's the stuff that I have to work with and you have to work with. And then another part of the five shot, fifth shot is, you know, the camera movement shot. And what I use is a little dolly that connects to an iPhone. And you can see here that I use, you know, I use a light on the mic stand because when I did this without a light, I realized that the shadows of of the space were in the shot that I was creating. So I thought, well, okay, how can I get rid of shadows? Well, one way to do that is just to create another light source that's not the light source that's creating the shadows. And that's what I did. I turned off all the lights and then put a light over top of the subject. There you go. And then here's a video of how that actually looks. So you can see I have a this little device that helps me stabilize the camera. I'm kind of moving the camera a bit just to make sure I got the right shot. And I did it over and over again, maybe 30 seconds. And then here's a shot on the left. You'll see how I got the shot on the right is just once again on a camera on a mic stand, my iPhone on, on a camera, or my iPhone on a mic stand with the adapter, and there's that's how you get the shot. So it's not it's not super clever, but it's good enough. All right, here's the elephant in the room: audio. You need to ask yourself how important is capturing audio at the shot level. If it is important, then you need to think about how to do that, and we can help you with that. If it is important, what do you need to make that happen? You're going to need a microphone. Like the golden rule of audio recording is the microphone has to be as close to the subject as it can be. And in all these shots that we just looked at, the camera was pretty far away from the subject. So I didn't capture any audio with them. I mean, I, the audio was captured, but I, did, I didn't need it. If it's not important, then you can do a voiceover. And in fact, we can help you do that. We have microphones and studios that are quiet to help you do that. So, to illustrate the, the difference between what's captured from an iPhone's microphone and, and a separate microphone, here's a video for you. Anybody can learn how to draw. I've said that. Um, doesn't matter how old you are, it's never too late to start. Um, all it takes is just... Sounds good, and, uh, but not good enough. Anybody can learn how to draw. Sounds way better, um, way better. It doesn't matter how old you are, it's never too late to start. Um, it, all it takes is just consistency and uh, learning how to see. Andrea has long hair, but... What you can't see is the microphone that's on her turtleneck there, right there. There is a microphone right next to her there. And this is what it was. A little gadget that's the size, maybe larger than a matchbook, that is an audio recorder with a microphone. And what I did is I, that I recorded it with that and then synced it with the audio from the iPhone. Got rid of the iPhone audio and replaced it with this audio. Problem solved. So, last but not least, there really is no reason for you to struggle when you need to make a video. The Reader Media Center and Stilly are here to help you. 
There's lots of talented people with all kinds of cool skills and expertise and I'm still learning myself about the expertise and skills of all these people. So if you can always reach out at these email addresses and we'll help you out. Thank you so much. See you next week. So as Troy mentioned, we had a little uh, difficulty with the system. So uh, what we've done is we've spliced Troy's part in and now we're gonna jump to Roy's part uh, right after this. And uh, if you remember, um, Roy is going to be showing a kind of more experimental shot, um, a more experimental video that he created with the same material that Troy had. So let's take a look at what Roy has done with that material. Okay, I'm sharing my screen here. Okay, this is, let me just explain. This, this is my interpretation of what Troy has shot. And I'm just trying to think what would it, if I were teaching a course or if a, a professor or instructor were to come to me with this footage and say, hey, um, I'm teaching meditation or I'm teaching art therapy, that's where I connected with it. I was like, wow, like, this could be a really nice art therapy video. So I'll play it for you and just go over some, some observations. It, it really just depends on um, what I'm feeling in the moment and uh, what's around me and what images uh, make me feel like I need to imitate them and uh, find my own way with them. Well, for me, it's all about maintaining a sense of texture and organicness with the shapes that I'm drawing. I find that whenever I'm trying to connect with a person's personality or unique um, sort of shape or lines. A pencil really allows me to explore that physically and um, with a visual texture that is really unique. Sometimes the motivation comes from different places at different times. Sometimes I'm just bored and I want to explore um, something random with my pencil. Sometimes I'm really inspired by a movie that I've seen or um, a TV show that I like, or a style that I like, or an art style that I like. I've been drawing pretty much my whole life. Anybody can learn how to draw. I've always said that. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are, it's never too late to start. Um, it, all it takes is just consistency and uh, learning how to see. Okay, so I wanna just talk through just a few things. I got to stop, share, and restart here. Did anybody notice uh, a difference between those two videos or what, what, any observations on it? So Gary mentions that music was added. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it told a little bit more of a story. I mean, I, and maybe maybe because the music added to that, it gave us a little bit of a, an extra layer and gave a little more storytelling. Mm. <laughs> yeah, those are good. So when I look at a video or, or footage for the first time as an editor, I'm just kind of going for what feels good, what, what seems good, what, what would capture somebody's attention. So in a sense, whereas Troy has got a style of very exacting and planning, I've got a style where it's like, I'm looking for that magic. I'm, I'm really trying to find what appeals to me instinctively. And when I looked at all this at the footage, I thought, that, wow, this would be a great ASMR film, which is like how people tend to fall asleep nowadays watching, watching YouTube ASMR with sounds that are therapeutic for them. And I just kind of got that vibe from it for three reasons. Um, the sound of the pencil, the drawings, and the subject's voice. So in, in, in starting, I just look for inspiration. And I put it on in, in the edit. I just put it on a timeline. And I go through every clip. And I'm not looking for great detail. I'm just looking to
to mark where I feel something. It, and, and this is a process, I'm more of a, a self-taught editor, but I've been trained by some editors and, and we call this process nuggeting. We're looking for the golden nuggets. And sometimes it's just as easy as finding like three or four golden nuggets, marking them and putting them on a timeline. And there you got, you got your film. Um, so I, I did that with this film. I kind of found the vibe of it and I was inspired to add music. Um, I've got a sound library called Artist IO. It's really like $15 a month, but they, they have some great music tracks. So I just added in a track that was very meditative. Um, and I, I literally edited to the music. I put the track down on the timeline, which we'll learn more about over the next couple of weeks and, and just found those shots that were really appealing and that really spoke to me and just laid it out. Um, I added basic effects. Um, and these are so simple to add. They're like a very basic blurring effect, a very basic blurring dissolve. I slowed the clips, the drawing clips down by like 20%. And, and just to give that feel of like the flow of the, of the drawing. Um, and then I found something really interesting in Troy's footage, which was the sound of the pencil. Uh, the, the pencil scratching. It's not on all the clips, but it is on, on the very tight close up. And on two of the shots, I use that and kind of increase the sound a little bit just to get for the viewer to kind of feel that they were there, just that added touch. And, and that for me is the magic. That's where, where you're looking for things that uh, when you shoot, you never know what you're going to get sometimes. And, and I'm looking for those surprises. <laughs> Where is Troy shooting for no surprises? <laughs> I'm going for more. I want to find the surprises and put them on the timeline. Um, and, and that kind of leads me to what Troy was talking about in the first place, which is shoot everything that you need. I tend to overshoot because you never know when you get to an edit what's, what'll work. It's, it's, it's amazing how you can, what may be a mistake, actually becomes part of the film that makes it more appealing. Um, so in, in shooting, I, I got plenty of footage uh, from, from Troy. The only thing I, I really needed was like, what I would love to have is the final drawing of the stills and more mic near the pencil just to, to capture that. But otherwise it was, it was really well shot and just plenty there to choose from. So. That's basically, I, I, it's a different style to some people, but I, I find it very, it's, it's kind of just very user-friendly to literally just find the clips you like, mark them, put them on the timeline, and, and you're, you're nearly there. Um, I, and I hope that helps. If you have any questions, just let me know. Yeah, that was great, Roy. That's, um, that... <clears throat> So interesting to be able to see what different people do to interpret um, the footage differently. I'm sorry I'm on this weird setup now. I had to kind of switch everything over. Um, but so Troy showed his shot, which I completely missed because I was um, down with the internet. The internet was not down with me. Um, and so and Roy's, you know, finding that magic um, is really great. I want to show you um, kind of what I've done with that same footage that um, it's more of a contextualization um, for academic kind of purposes. Um, so what am I doing with this story? First, I'll play it and then we'll kind of talk about it. Hi, this is Mike with Studio for Teaching and Learning Innovation. Today, we're talking to Drea George about how she uses a pencil to really get the most out of her drawing. So why, is, why do you like drawing in pencil? Well, for me, it's all about maintaining a sense of texture and organicness with the shapes that I'm drawing. I find that whenever I'm trying to connect with a person's personality or unique 
um, sort of shape or lines. The pencil really allows me to explore that um, physically and uh, with a visual texture that is really unique. Do you have any certain uh, advice for people who want to like learn how to draw or get into drawing? Anybody can learn how to draw. I've always said that. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are, it's never too late to start. Um, it, all it takes is just consistency and uh, learning how to see, um, using reference material, finding things online. There's tons of resources online. There's lots of tutorials out there now. Um, yeah, anybody can start anytime. And yeah, it's just a matter of practice. Okay, so the way that I approach that is basically, um, oops. I'm looking at how um, text and narration can kind of contextualize my content. So if you notice, um, I pop in at the beginning of the video to kind of let people know um, what they're gonna see before they see it. And from uh, an instructional perspective, that's always a, a kind of good idea. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm making my choices for video production is how am I going to put the instructor, pre instructor presence in there? Um, so how am I going to make it meaningful for the students that I'm actually the one producing this video? So for me at the beginning of that video, for example, even though it's because, even though it's about uh, somebody else and somebody else is doing the interview, if I'm going to incorporate that into my class and contextualize it into my class, what I really like to do is have something like that where I do a brief introduction and then I do an, uh, an outro. So an intro and an outro where I just kind of introduce that. And the important thing there for me is for them to see my face at the beginning, at the very beginning. Um, and I'll show you how to do all that when we get into the video editing, if that's a style that you like. Um, but what I generally do, and I do that in my tutorials, and, and I think is very effective for instruction as well, is the first 30 seconds, um, you talk to the camera and you, you just focus on talking to the camera. And then as soon as you're done talking to the camera, you can continue doing what you're doing and look at your notes. And then you can just read off of your notes because what's gonna happen is that's when the video editing is gonna happen. And anytime you wanna make another point and you want to know that you're gonna cut away to the camera, you're gonna look at the camera. And this goes back to Troy's kind of five shots because this is always one of the shots that I'm talking about when I'm talking to uh, the students. Another shot is gonna be, you know, whatever it is that I'm showing people. So think about how you're going to connect with your, with your audience and, and um, not only in what I'm, you're, the video that you're gonna be in, but how are you going to narrate? And that's one of the great things about um, any of these uh, video projects is I can always layer and contextualize things. So how am I gonna use content? How am I gonna contextualize it to, to sort of suit my needs? And so we're gonna talk a lot about that. And the other thing that, and if you noticed, you know, the, the terms pop up uh, at various points when she's, when she's discussing them, uh, because these are things that I want students to take away from. These are the key terms that I want students to understand. I would put a, a chart in there if this is a key chart that I want students to understand. In other videos, I'll show you how to put arrows that are going to point to things. So it's really important internally contextualizing to have all those pointers that are really gonna help you tell your story, right? Um, so the questions about that? And we're gonna do all that. I'm gonna, you know, I'll show you how to put in arrows, text, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's really fun. Um, and then we're, we're also gonna- I do oh, have a quick question, Mike. On your, uh, on your terms that you're dropping in, is that basically a PowerPoint that you are recording? And actually, there are so many ways to do that tomorrow. It depends on the effect that you want to have. So you notice how I did it in this video. It pops up behind her. It's, poor, it's, it's sort of organically there in the I don't have to cut away. And I like to do that when it's just a single term, right? Something that I don't want to pull somebody away from. And I just want to be able to, to put that term in and say, this is going to be important for later. So I'll do something like that. But if it's more information, then what I'll do is I'll just make a PowerPoint into JPEGs, for example, and then I'll import those into help tell the story. And, and there are all kinds of nice ways that you can do that. You can be talking and the um, PowerPoint can be to the side of you in, you know, if you noticed when I started introducing all of those uh, images, all of the end videos where she's drawing so many times, uh, that could be anything. It doesn't have to be her drawing. It could be 
you know, a video of a concept. It could be a PowerPoint while you're talking in the side. Uh, all of those things are possible. It could be, you know, the way you're manipulating something. If you're teaching somebody a hand movement or if you're teaching somebody a gesture, all those things. Um, so you could, you could put anything um, in there. Mike, can I ask how long did it take? So did that answer your question? Together, I, I just want to get an idea of time. Yeah, yeah. So once I I I am um, I got the slides from uh, Troy. I got all of the content from Troy, right? So I knew what I wanted. So imagine I know what I want. I know what I'm shooting. I have everything. I've got it all set up. I'm gonna put it in this program. I'm gonna have this nice two minute video that I've just made, and I've passed the learning curve where, where I now can do things fairly efficiently. This took me to do half an hour. Okay, and, and Roy, when you did yours, how long did it take you to do it? I, I took, I kind of timed myself and challenged myself to do it in 30 minutes, but it took about 40 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a really great question, Barbette. Um, and then, we're going to talk a little bit later on external. Where should these things live, right? So what's the difference, for example, once I've created my content? If I'm going to put it in YouTube, YouTube has certain affordances. And we're going to talk about those affordances as you start to produce content and, you know, where, where should something live? Um, or Panopto, that's another place where it can live. And there are other affordances for Panopto. Um, and then there are other considerations. How important is this for me to control it? Um, how much do I wanna share this with the world? So all of those, how easy do I want this to be to find? Is it, do I need to contextualize it? Is it gonna be part of a website where this is going to point you to other um, ideas and concepts, right? So thinking not only about pre-production, production and post-production, but thinking also about what's how this thing is going to have a life after it's been produced. And that's a really important consideration. So Troy says he was 14 minutes to do that one. All right, so. No, no, two hours to, to gather 14 minutes of footage. Oh, two hours to gather 14 minutes of footage. Yeah, so bad that, that, bad. that like, there's a ratio of like, even though you saw 30 seconds of, of something, there was a, a total of 14 minutes of actual footage that was taken and it took two hours to shoot that 14 minutes. Right, and you have different considerations depending on what it is that you're trying to produce. So if you're trying to produce uh, a really good presentation of a PowerPoint that you have, um, you're gonna spend time getting the PowerPoint to the point where you think it's uh, you know, photogenic enough to, to actually show. Right, so that's gonna take a little time. And then you may want to have a few different angles where you're gonna be talking. And you may want to cut away to examples um, that you're gonna show as you're discussing these things. So you're gonna to wanna to gather all of this content, right? So you may find something on YouTube that you're like, great, I wanna incorporate this because it's a perfect example. And then how do I get this out of YouTube and how do I put it in my project, right? So these are all considerations that we'll have to um, talk about as we go. So just to clarify, if I'm going to do, say, a 50 minute lecture in which I, I want, I'm doing an ace, um, asynchronous lecture and I want to have PowerPoint in it, I want to have some other things. I mean, judging from what Troy said and y'all said, I, it's sounding like I need hours and hours to do that or am I misunderstanding? And again, it, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish, Barbette. What I think is you decide how much time you want to dedicate. Mm -hmm. You okay. be able to do this, that, or the other thing is going to be very time consuming. So you may want to avoid that this time. Or, you know, you know, you may want a slightly different project that you can that you really are going to be able to to throw yourself into because it's something that you really are, are passionate about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. And I would say, here's the thing. Find yourself a one to two minute project that you're interested in pursuing for right now for purposes of um, doing the, the, this project, learning the techniques, learning the software, figuring out 
uh, how you're gonna accomplish things. Um, and if you've got that project, then you can start gathering those materials. You can start gathering all of the, the things that the resources that you'll need, and then it'll be a lot easier for you to, to say whether or not this is worth it. And right. Barbette and Mike, you know, the five shot exercise is a good, is a good way to practice. Like just do like do a five shot exercise, Barbette, I, like invent something. You're making scallops and do five shots of you making scallops or making bread or something like that. And then see how, how long that takes. And, you know, is it, you know, is it worth it or not? Mm. Okay. Thanks. And I can show you a little bit um, before we um, stop here. I want to show you what the software looks like. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like when I have all the clips and what it would actually take for me um, to do it. Because I like, you know, I'm not agonizing over how creative it is. I have to put these things out all the time. I'm, I'm putting out content constantly. So, you know, I appreciate Troy and Roy's perspectives on things. I, I can't work like that because I have to put something out all the time. So my ways are a little bit more kind of bull in China shop. And I'll show you the way that I do that, but then they'll have their ways of doing things. Do you agree with that, Roy? You're laughing. Yeah, I'm laughing too. <laughs> Very much agree with that. Yeah. And Gary raised his hand. Gary. Yeah. So we probably need to be willing to kill our darlings, right? We, we're going to think this is the greatest thing we've ever made, and we're going to play with it, and we're, we're going to show it to someone. And they're going to go, "You would actually show that to a class? Are you crazy?" <laughs> and so we have to be willing to do that. I'm just guessing that comes with the vulnerability, right? Exactly. You're right. Okay. I mean, you yeah. know, when it comes to cinema, the amateurs are the one who who survive, right? It, amateurs, you know, you don't have to be an expert. You have to be uh, like a like a curious human being. That's all. That's all it takes. That's it's also why, like, I like to show rough cuts to people to say, you know, I might be passionate about this particular film, but then I show it to somebody and they're like, no, <laughs> you know, that's not working. So I I'll have to go back to the drawing board and do something else but to have other eyes on it, because when you're editing, you get so focused on, on the edit itself. I have a quick question. Uh, and I've asked this a number of times and it may be so stupid that everybody's just not gonna answer it. Uh, is there a difference between using an iPhone and an Android phone in recording? Te technically, no. I mean, they both have cameras, right? Right. Is one better than the other? Well, I mean, that's a that's a that can be subjective, but I, uh, yeah, I, no, that's I, that's, a, that's a huge question. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. iPhones are so much better. Anyway. I wouldn't go out and buy a better phone for this camera. I think they're all going to be adequate. I mean, I think I, I think you know that you know the iPhone 12 just was recently released, and it's and it really does is a game changer in terms of having one camera in your pocket that can do telephoto wide close-ups in one, one device and also do LIDAR scanning at the same time and, and do Dolby Vision editing. So it's, it, that, like it's, it, it's, it's a huge game changer, but there still is also the elephant in the room, the audio, right? I mean, you, could, you can watch all these cool videos on Apple's website about how cool the iPhone is, but all the but all you know, all the audio is another thing altogether. But but Tamara, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think you know theoretically there's no difference between a camera on an Android or a, like a recent Android phone and a recent iPhone. I don't know. But Roy, you know, you know, there you're right. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's also, but there's also a, a huge amount of tools now that you can access that help that phone, whether it be a iPhone or Android, to look like a moving camera. You've got gimbals, you've got tripods. What, Troy, what you were showing in terms of the the um, how you attach that that iPhone. So there's a lot more peripheral equipment that makes that phone look better. Right, and and I think that's one of the points that, you know, to drive home is that there is, there is 
lots of resources right now that you have available to everybody in this room, in this Zoom room, you know, to make a shot that's stable or to make a shot that, you know, with a phone that's movement, that sort of thing. Yes, we can do that. We can help you with that. But I don't want to get into the Android iPhone, you know, question. Yeah, there's so many other things to worry about before you start thinking Android iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Beth, you had your hand up. Do you want your computer, uh, you want everything to be kind of talking the same language? You don't want to put an, uh, an iPhone with a PC computer, do you? I mean, if that's what you got, that's what you got. But I mean, it's easier, certainly, if you have all Mac products. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Uh, going all Mac is easier than trying to do anything other than all Mac. I don't care what else you say. If it's Mac, if it's an iPhone and Windows, it's not great. If it's an Android and anything, it's not great. But if it's a Mac and a Mac, you know, it, it just if it's Apple and Apple, it works. Yeah. That's okay. mine. Thanks. I'm ready for upgrades, so it's good to good to be better. <laughs> I mean, if it were me and I were upgrading, I would go Mac. There's okay. really, really no question across the board. Okay, Bab says raise your hand. What's up, Bab? Yes, thank you, um, Roy. I'm a little intrigued by your planning or non-planning process. And I'm wondering, are you not storyboarding because Troy did the storyboarding for you? Yes, for this project. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I know that Troy has laid it all out and he's got everything needed. So I can just go and not have to plan away because he's so planned. I know that I've got what I need. Um, it's also another style, like I shoot a lot of documentaries or have shot a lot of doc documentaries. And a lot of that is you shoot on the fly. You, you, you try to get what you, can, you get in a journalistic sense. And then you go back and pick out the best from that. So there's a little bit less planning if you're doing kind of like a journalistic documentary. Okay. But then that Thank takes you. longer to edit in the end, right? Oh, yeah. So the more planning you do up front, the less problems you're going to have in the editing room. The less planning you do up front, the more sorting you're going to do in the editing room. It just depends on where you're, where you like to be your, where you like to be creative. Am I a very organized person? If you're a very organized person, it's really wonderful for you to script everything out. And you know, it'll, that's where you're going to take your time and it's going to be great. And everything's going to be orderly and you're going to snap things in the way I'm going to show you in uh, the video editing program. And it's going to be done. Right. Um, but then you're going to have other footage and, you know, we're going to do a story next week that Roy is going to talk about that Roy shot um, showing a, a dance, a COVID dance that I'm really excited for everyone to see. And we're going to do a similar thing. Roy has his shot. I have my shot. And I'm going to, sh we're going to show you that. And then we're, and you'll see what my video looks like on the cutting board when I had to deal with Roy's footage versus when I, I'm dealing with Troy's footage. It's, you know, it's so much messier because I'm moving things around, right? So that's just kind of the way things are. Um, now, a lot of people are doing, um, you know, lectures and they just want to, they just want to prepare their lectures. That's great. But now there's a power to the spontaneity that Roy is talking about as well. Where can I inject spontaneity? Where can I inject liveliness? Where can I inject movement so that it's not a lecture? Because if it's a lecture, you know, you might as well just record your PowerPoint and an audio within just have people click through the slides, right? We're looking for something better than that. There, there's also, depending on what edit system you use, and this with, with, with Mike is teaching this particular one, um, I have a very clear way of ordering shots and looking at shots so that I know where they are. So in that sense, I'm ordered for spontaneity. Um, and just recently, I've been getting into the work of uh, David Lynch a lot more. And he is big on, he will literally take a camera into a scene and get an idea for it and shoot it and then shoot another it just keeps shooting just on ideas. So it's a completely intuitive, imaginative way of, of filmmaking. That's not, that's not common or typical. And it's, it's just something that I'm learning from right now. 
Yeah, great. Any other questions before we kind of jump May I ask into a, a the follow up? So Mike, where do you fit in the planning spectrum and where are you spending your time for instructional videos in the pre-planning or the post-production? So for me, most of the in time that I've spent has gone into um, years and years of preparation and knowledge. So I, I know it. So I get up there and I say what it is that I got to say. And I, my preparation is in, in getting my story before I get in front of the camera. And then I, I'm, I used to be really bad about cutting things up, but I just keep going. So when I make a mistake, I just repeat it and I say it exactly how I want to say it. And I just keep going and I keep going. And then when I get into that cutting room, I'm brutal. And I go bang, bang, bang. I squeeze it together and I'm done. So for me, it's, it's being a master of my uh, material. That's the most important thing. And I'm lucky that way because I'm not asking anybody for anything. I'm doing it myself. And that's a lot of what you folks are going to be doing too, because you're the master of your material as well. So a lot of that is going to have to do with you knowing what you're going to say and being passionate about saying it, right? Um, that's a lot of what it's going to come down to. Yes, Tyler. Yeah, so I have some um, experience doing some video editing. In fact, Troy and I worked together to so I could be the um, point person for chemistry to put together our graduation video, which was um, so many hours of editing that I'm not volunteering for that again, but it was a great experience. Uh, one thing that I am interested in, and I'm not sure if this is maybe beyond the scope of, of this um, evening Zoom series or not, uh, but you have talked about the many resources available in terms of tools. Um, I have watched um, the, the um, how do you, the esports players, uh, the people that are, are broadcasting on Twitch or whatever, um, and they're showing their video games and they have all of their different camera ready angles uh, in these fancy setups just ready to go. So they can be showing one angle with, with their image off to the side and in real time they'll hit a button and things will switch over and they'll maybe have uh, the, the direct shot of the, of the screen or, or whatever they're doing. And uh, and that seems really nice for a lecture style format. You know, the, this, this five angle shot, the, the human side, the, the, the close up on the action, I really like that. And I'm thinking, how could I do that in a lecture setting where I'm you know, teaching many minutes of material, wanting to be able to focus on different things in real time as opposed to editing it together afterward. Again, that may be beyond the scope of what we're looking for, but are there resources to do something like that? Yes, Tyler, there are. Yeah, there, there is a, you know, Black Magic, the company Black Magic has just come out with a really interesting uh, device that allows you to input, mul have multiple inputs via HDMI. So it could be five cameras, for example. So you're talking about, you know, Twitch and people playing video games. So it could be like a, a feed from the computer, it could be a feed from Twitch, it could be a feed from a, a, a camera. Excuse me, off radio. <laughs> Yeah, so we could like it's it it's possible. It is it is like I mean it, it could be a fail waiting to happen. I don't know, but it's it's totally Tyler, possible. Tyler, I would I would add also in your building in um, in ISC if you want to be really really ambitious, uh, Paul Kefaber in biology in sorry psychology has set up basically this. So he's using some software called OBS. I've uh, used that before. Yeah. yeah where he's got, he's got a microscope going and he's got uh, a little screen. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like the CNN map room after elections. You know, he's got all of those feeds going and he can switch from one to the other. It's a, it's, it's a steep climb, I'll tell you, because I played with OBS a little bit and I would have liked to have played with it more, but it's, it's a pretty steep learning curve, but you can do amazing things with it. Yeah, I have used OBS before and the idea of, of using it to, to cut down on the edit time, you know, it's it's one thing to prepare my academic material. Another time, another thing to spend an hour editing it together. And so, if if I can make it have some of these elements of of story and different shots to convey different emotions and feelings, I would rather do that during the shooting rather than the editing. Um, so, knowing that the resources and the cameras and the software are accessible, um, that's a really good thing to know. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, once you have all those shots together, if you're getting all those shots simultaneously, um, 
then you've got a really easy time bringing that into the software and deciding when it's important um, for you to show your hands versus when it's important for you to, to have your face on video. And you don't have to be thinking about that. So other questions, or do we wanna take a look at the, uh, the software that we're talking about and see what, that's, what that looks like? Yeah, I have a question. So may I jump in? Yeah. Uh, Suzanne, um, I have a lot of ethnographic video, like hours and hours and hours of, you know, footage of musicians and events and driving down, you know, interesting roads and cars with people talking to me or, you know, singing in the car, or whatever. Um, so my, it, you know, my in, a sort of creative envisioning for a narrative of a film is more like, narrating, um, you know, stitching together examples through narration or jumping, you know, from place to place in a long, long event. How can I convey in, you know, three minutes what happened in three hours kind of thing and sort of do I do that with me as a talking head? Do I do that by just, you know, voicing over some narration and turning the sound down or I'm just, so that, that's kind of what I have in mind and whether I would use that for class or a conference presentation or to accompany, a, you know, a, a, like web stuff or an article or a chapter um, that I've published, so. Yeah, and those things are going to um, make themselves visible as you tell that story. So when, as you're telling the story, that happens to me all the time. As I tell stories and as I, um, as I think about how I'm gonna convey those stories, the, the way that um, you're going to convey it becomes apparent because you're gonna watch it and you're gonna say, it doesn't convey what I, what I mean for it to convey. And what I need here is some, a cutaway to a video or what I need here is some audio or what I need here is a chart or I need a map that's gonna, con that's gonna move as I'm talking about this next place that I go into. Right, so that's gonna, that, those things are gonna reveal themselves. And that's kind of the wonderful thing of, about discovery when you're putting together a video and, and communicating through that kind of language. You, you, you're deciding on the story that you're telling, but then you're allowing yourself to, to be flexible in how you're telling that story. Now, also, Anne, you're, you're in the territory of post-industrial coping mechanisms. I mean, you have a lot of footage, a lot of stuff to deal with. So it really is, you know, I mean, that's a challenge. I mean, I don't know how you could take four, would you say three, 300 hours or something of footage to make it into something that's- No, know. I mean, I, I've just been, you know, I've got stuff from just years of doing field work that is just kind of sitting there. I'm hoarding it, you know? Yeah, and you're gonna decide on what your story is. Like, okay, I've got all this footage, right? I've got 300 hours of footage. I wanna tell a story about it. Is there a story that is presenting itself to me? Well, I think it's really multiple stories, right? So how do I get brave about making, yeah, about chunking it, right? Where I, I can do this in class easily. I do it in class all the time. I do it at conferences. I'd like to be able to like make it a little more polished and, yeah. you know, put it out there. And yeah. I think that this is, this is where Roy's approach is really fantastic. I, I, I think that, that, you know, sort of the idea of the nugget is with that much footage, Troy is absolutely right. You know, I, I suffer from this all the time. I've got, my computer at home has got 250,000 photos. You know, to, to, to do something holistically with all of it is impossible. So, you know, every now and then I'll be like, oh, I'd like to do something that, you know, that has to do with like landscapes in winter. And then you, you select from there. And then you start with, you know, what do I think the nuggets are in, in what I have and what's nice about that is once you've selected those nuggets, they typically ap apply to other projects as well. So then you could start with very specific projects. And once you've put a few of those together, maybe you can start making a bigger overarching uh, sort of project based on what you've done for those smaller projects. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point. You know, if you have one person whose story that you want to tell, that's probably the best way to start. Also, also finding somebody to look at the footage and 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 see what what they find interesting might help that thereby it's not all on you to find and tell everything you're relying on like an editor or somebody who can hey this is really interesting um, 
because it is a long process if, if, if it's, if you don't nugget, if you don't condense it, it's just, it, it is very time consuming. But you know, and that's, that's the kind of a story though, and that you're gonna wanna tell in that kind of a way, because this has been such a big part of your life. And to, to be able to, you know, tell a compelling story about that is a really wonderful thing to be able to do. As long as it doesn't take you that much time. We, just really quick, we, in, in the UK, we did a project that was hundreds of hours of footage of people just around the table talking about business. And we were at a loss as to how to edit it together. A producer came in and said, I'm gonna just edit, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna interview the, the guy who funded all the conversations. What is his story about it? We interviewed that guy and we were able to put, put the project together around that guy's interview. So it, it really was kind of a really interesting way of condensing, but also getting to the heart of what you're trying to say, if that makes any sense. Anybody else? Comments, questions, stories that they think that that we haven't mentioned that you think that you want to pursue that might be difficult to tell in a way that that you, you may need to hear it differently of how you might approach it. Um, I really want to see the software and so I don't want to delay us seeing the software but maybe afterwards you can advise me on how to capture me writing um, math stuff on a tablet. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we'll Thanks. talk about that. And we'll actually, the individual things, and that's the great thing. Once you go off and you decide on the stories that you're going to tell, you're going to have Troy, you're going to have Roy, you're going to have me that you'll be able to get in touch with and um, partner with us and we'll help you through those specific details of, you know, oh, I need to do this one thing. So what's going to happen from this point on is I'll show you the software, I'll show you where to get it. Um, there are, there's a tutorial that you can look at that's fairly easy if you want to get sort of started with it. But the idea is just to download the software to think about your story. That's the main thing that I want you to do. Um, and then if you want to practice with the software, you can practice with it. But then we'll come together again next week. We'll look at uh, Roy's video and we'll look at different interpretations of that. And then we'll actually get into the nuts and bolts of editing with that software. Um, so without further ado, let me just show you uh, this software. It's called OpenShot Video Editor. It's the reason that I'm choosing OpenShot Video Editor. Let me choose it here. All right, so now if you've worked with other video editing programs before, you should it should look kind of familiar to you. Uh, this is the basic layout of the OpenShot Video Editor. Uh, what you see here in the middle is um, that's where your video is going to be. Um, if you look here on the left hand side, uh, this is where all of your project files are going to be and some of the other things like the transitions and the effects. Um, then we have a funky little area on the left hand side, the far left hand side, that's going to be really important um, to the way that we interact with our video clips and our, our other footage and our um, audio and, you know, our text. And that's the, each of the objects that we're going to be pulling into the software has properties and we're going to be able to adjust all the properties right there on the side and at the bottom we've got a timeline so that's your basic configuration and um, the thing about the open shot video editor that you'll that is um, particularly nice is that everything goes onto a track you notice there's track one track two you can have as many tracks as you want and tracks that lay underneath other tracks get covered up by those tracks. Um, so if it's a video track, it, it will, whatever track is the top track will play. So let me just kind of give you a very brief overview of how I would pull in um, some video content. And I've got that same video content for you to play around with. So the, 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 the stuff that Troy shot um, and the audio content that Troy has, I, we've made available to you um, in Google Drive. So after this, if you wanted to download the software and download those files, you could play around and see how to make a story with that. And I'll show you where that's gonna live. Um, so now if I wanted to import all that stuff, it's very easy. I've got lots of different options for importing. You see, I have a little plus here to import files um, at the top. If I don't wanna click on the plus, I can right click um, somewhere inside the box where all my resources are and I can hit import files this way. And I'll click on import files and then I'll just grab all of that 
content that's in that folder. So now I've opened everything, my movie files, my, my WAV file. Um, if there were any image files, I could do that here as well. And now they are gonna, everything's a little wonky and slow because of the internet. But as you notice now, everything has been uh, imported here into my um, project files. And I can show all of my project files. I can show just my video files. I can show just my audio file. Um, and if I had any image files, I could show them here. Um, and then it's just a matter of grabbing. I'm gonna grab my audio file because this is the way I like to construct my videos is I get my audio segment first and I drag that into place. Um, and then I can go into my video areas and I can just grab all my videos and I can start deciding where I wanna put those as well. And the choices that we're gonna make um, are gonna affect how our video looks, right? So. Let me go ahead and pull that up a little bit. So I'm gonna overlay two videos on top of each other. So I've got the audio down below. I've got the, the first video up on top of that with a little bit of overlay in the timeline. And I've got a second video and let's see what that looks like. And I'm just gonna hit play to see what that looks like. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so that everyone can see it. Okay, looks like it's going. So now, as you notice, the video comes in later. So you're, you'll be looking at me. Okay. And then as soon Thank as it you. crosses over into that next video, it switches over. So that's the basic concept. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be layering. We're going to be um, putting in uh, images. We're going to be putting in PowerPoints. We're going to be putting in titles. Uh, we're going to be thinking about um, you know, what shots look best for the, for the message that we're sending at this particular moment. So what are we doing from here? Uh, for next time, uh, I'd like for everyone to think at least about their story or their script. If they don't want to do that, uh, they can just borrow the text, the, the, the audio and the clips that uh, Troy has made available to us. Um, make a shot list or a storyboard. Then as much as you can gather or record your materials, if you want help, throughout the week, recording and gathering your materials and doing all of this stuff, we expect you to get in touch with us, okay? Because this is going to be a really good time for you to start um, getting your stuff ready and, you know, arrange to have a, a session with us and, and uh, get the help that you need so that next week you'll have all the materials that you need. And then the last thing that you need to do is just go to openshot.org and you'll download that software. So I'll send you a link to the website that I created um, that has all these resources. Um, I'll just send the, the, a link to everybody after this um, meeting. I'll just email everyone with that information. Um, but that's my intention. And uh, hopefully that is cool with Troy and Roy. And hopefully this is something that everyone is excited about uh, being able, able to pursue. So questions, comments, I'll stop my share. Um, are there things that you want to do that um, I didn't mention or that Troy didn't mention or that Roy didn't mention that we might rejigger things and, and make sure that's part of the program. Yeah, Mateo. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Mateo. I have a question related to um, the software, actually. This is just out of curiosity. I worked with uh, Troy and with some folks at the Media Center last semester. Man, it feels like two years ago. Uh, and um, yeah, I remember that there were and there are many softwares, both, of course, at the media center, but also like um, available on online. Uh, so we're just wondering if this open shot, uh, which actually I don't remember, but maybe it's just me. Is it something that uh, we're using it because it's it's very good in general or because it's something that is also is good, but also, you know, like a easy to get and to use for all of us as like a class? It has, so, it has a lot of advantages. So the first advantage is, big advantage, is it's free. And the reason that that's important is because not only is it gonna be important for you to, to be able to use, but then if you're gonna offer this as something that you wanna to give to your students as a project, we wanna be able, we want you to know what your students are getting into um, as this free option. And it's a really excellent option. 
Um, the other thing that I really love about OpenShot is that it is cross-platform. And that's one of the only things that, that's one of the only video editing programs that really does a nice job that's free and is cross-platform. Uh, and the third thing that I really like about it is that it's very easy for you to learn all the skills in OpenShot that you're then going to be very um, capable to, to use in many other of the um, video editing programs. It's, it's most similar to Camtasia. When we actually start using it, you'll notice. Um, but Camtasia is really expensive. And I've been working with Camtasia. I love Camtasia. Camtasia is my go-to. Um, but there are things about OpenShot that I actually like better because it does them, it does a few things easier. And you know what's happening to me? I'm starting, and this is what Troy was saying before, I'm starting to think about how I'm gonna produce my videos based on the tool that I have now. And, I, and then when I did that ending with the four videos, with the, with the four uh, shots in each of the corners, I don't know how to do that immediately in Camtasia. But that was something that I learned immediately because it was so easy to use in OpenShot. And I said, okay, this is something that I'll bring in. And I, I brought it in, not because I had that idea to do it before, but because that was an affordance that the software offered me. So there are lots of different, th th those are the main reasons that I've, I've um, went with OpenShot. If you ask Troy what he uses, that's, he's not gonna be using OpenShot. If you ask Roy what he's using, he's not gonna use, use OpenShot. OpenShot from my perspective, and you know, I will fight both of them. No, I won't actually fight them. But from, from an academic perspective, um, something like Camtasia and OpenShot are gonna be your best first option. Thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, Audrey, you had your hand up before? Uh, I did, I think you sort of just answered my question. It was really, it was really the uh, iPhone to PC using OpenShot and if, you know, because you were obviously using a Mac with the example. So it, it was, if there are any extra tricks that we need to know before we go out there doing our filming on our little iPhones that no, we need no, to know. Go for it. Um, others, questions? Uh, let's see, two participants have raised their hands. Let me see who they are. Um, oh, it looks like Babs, you have your hands raised, go ahead. And also Ann did too, I think, and Babs, Ann and Babs. Okay, let's start with Babs. Sorry, that was from before. I oh, okay. Oh, let me put your hand up. Uh, Barbette, was that also from before? Oh, okay, go ahead, Barbette, yeah. You're on mute. One of the things I'm interested in doing is being able to take um, cuts from commercial DVDs, Hollywood films, and use them in um, a, a presentation that I would be doing in a lecture. Uh, so I'm just wondering, because I did this a while ago. In fact, Troy helped me do this, where I was taking like clips of Julius Caesar building a bridge across the Rhine uh, that had been done on PBS with really cool special effects when I was talking about Caesar's invasion of Germania. So um, I'm wondering if, if you were, we're, we're going to be going over how to do things like that as well, as opposed to just video that you created yourself. Yeah, we're going to be talking about a little bit of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Barbette, you know, that's another thing that, you know, if that's what you want to do, if you have like a project that you want to do with that, like reach out to me. It, that's easy peasy. Like we can make that happen. No problem. I'd like to incorporate other things with it. That's sort of why I wanted to do this, this class. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's one of the things that, I mean, is essential in the way that I think about how I construct things. I want to, I want to borrow as much, you know, as I can. And yeah, you're going to learn how to do that. And there are many ways to do that. It really, there are so many ways to do that. And it really depends on, on what you need and how you need it. Right. So if you need a perfectly clean version of a lot of it, then, you know, there's one way that we can do it. If you just need something that's going to be as a representation for something that you're, you know, then now we can do it a little bit dirtier. Uh, it's really going to depend on, on why you need it and what part of the story it plays. Yeah, I'm just hoping that it's easier to do when I did it. I guess it was about six years ago or something, maybe even eight years ago that I did this originally and it was was very time consuming to do it. And I'm just wondering how much time. In fact, when I first tried doing it, it took like two hours to digitize a five minute video. 
And what I generally do these days is I find out a way to capture it off of my computer while I'm recording. Uh, yeah, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, and Barbette, things have changed since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, digitizing digitizing a, a few minute video clip should not take anywhere near that long. Nowadays. Okay, and Ann Rasmussen has her okay. hands up. Right. Super. Two quick questions. So one, pursuant to Barb uh, Barbette's comment, um, and Mike was working with me today to if you've got if you do it like this kind of weird way where you open up you know you open a Zoom video you play your thing and you record it, right? So it's like, then you've got it and you want your students to watch this clip. When you get, when you've recorded that clip, it says, download these four files. Do you need all those four files or can you, you just need the MP4 video? You don't need any, you don't need anything. And if you've recorded it to the cloud, it moved it to Panopto for you. Yeah, but what if you want to then edit it? You want to edit yourself. Like oh, yeah, then just download the MP4. Just at the MP4. Okay, then my other question is when I see you and you've got in that program, uh, OpenShot Video Editor, you've got a video and then you've got an audio track. And I've been doing these like virtual music videos and I understand you do the video and then you split out the audio. Is Does that program split out your audio for you? It, it can. Does. Wow. I do that most of the time. So what I generally do for my videos is I record my entire track um, on video. Mm -hmm. And then what I do is in um, Camtasia or in OpenShot, I've been doing it more in OpenShot now, is I'll, I'll split my audio and my video and then I'll chop my video right after I make my first point and before I turn to the screen where I want people to watch. And then the audio will just play perfectly and then my video will just go off. So that's, ge that's generally just how my workflow goes is to separate the audio and the video because then I can pop the video back in when I want to or I can, you know, it just, that remains a constant track for me. That's very cool, thank you. And it, again, it all depends on your workflow. Some people that works for, some people it doesn't. And you're gonna discover who you are as a, a, a producer of content. Other comments, questions, it's kind of wrapping up. So- um, Yeah, I have a question, this is Gary. Yeah. So I just went to OpenShot to download it and it wants a credit card. No, not openshot.org. Yep. To verify your account, it says it wants a credit card. No, what you did then, yep. you probably went to OpenShot in Google and then you clicked on the advertisement. I bet you it's not the OpenShot site. Well, it says openshot.org forward slash download. Really? Yep. <laughs> okay, let me go to it. I'm gonna share my screen with everyone. Okay. Because that should not be the case. It just makes me wonder. <laughs> no, because that's not that's not the case at all, or unless they changed it yesterday. All right, so here we have download version 2.5.1. Open download. And it downloaded it. Did you see me do that? Yeah, yeah. It said it wanted me to go to uh, when I did that. It wanted. You might me have to clicked on the wrong link. So here, watch what I'm doing again. Okay. So I'm at Open Shot. Mm -hmm. You notice down here at the bottom, download version two point five point one. You with me? Yep. Gary, there is a paid paid version of it. So maybe you might have went in that direction. And then after you've done that, you see I have OS 10, but you'll have whatever you have for Windows or whatever. And then you'll hit that download and then it'll download it. I noticed at one point that it was saying you had to activate your account. And I'm wondering if it's asking you for a credit card when you activate your account so that they can then, uh, which would include maybe asking for a credit card number? Mm, no, they never. When you signed up? I'm they, just kidding. maybe they, they changed that. We'll sign up, they just download the software. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I just did it, it's working now. Yeah, you should, once you download it, it shouldn't ask for you for anything. Okay, yeah, cool. okay, yeah, there is a paid version, but you don't need it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for pointing that out though. I'm sure that would have gotten a lot of people caught up.
Okay, so everyone now sees how to download it. So great, I'll stop my share. That was that was perfect way to end. Thank you for checking on that. Um, anybody else? I'm excited. Hope you're excited. So um, I'll send you an email as you um, want to meet with us to talk about your ideas. Just give us a holler. Um, if you don't know who to holler at, just holler at me, and I'll sort of pass you off to people. And um, yeah. Have a, have a wonderful rest of your evening. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone next week. Take care. Thanks a lot.